Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he came, or gave rather, commandment to depart unto the other side. That would be the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, the birds have in the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not any place to lay his head. And another of his disciples said to him, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Let's pray. Father, we come before your word this morning. How we thank you for it. I pray we would glean something from it that would encourage us in our walk of faith. And I pray it through Christ. Amen. Well, obviously, Jesus is talking about discipleship here. And that's what we're going to talk about, discipleship. It's tough to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's not an easy thing. And so the context here, obviously, is that Jesus as an itinerant teacher. Now remember, Jesus walked about the nation of Israel and taught people each and every day. It was not uncommon. So I don't think what Jesus was doing was uncommon. It was common for different teachers uh, to gather their disciples together and to propagate whatever they were teaching or whatever new thing they came up with. But there were, in fact, other men that were teaching the word of God and, uh, and had their disciples. The only difference was that Jesus was the son of God and performed great mighty miracles. So therefore, most everybody began to follow him. Now, if you know anything about the uh, three years or three and a half years of Jesus' uh, ministry, the first year of his ministry was a year of growing popularity. In other words, people began to hear about this, this man from Galilee that's healing people, this man from Galilee that's teaching us the word of God with great authority, greater than the Pharisees, the religious crowd. And then that second year was a year where it kind of plateaued, where thousands followed him. And the third year was a year of declining popularity. And that began when Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no part with me. And people took that in a literal sense, and they said, well, this is getting a little tough. And here's one of these tough parts. It's not easy to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so those that make a nominal commitment soon fall away. Those that love the Lord with all their heart and know that they've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, they have a stick to itiveness. And we're going to look at these two men. They're on the opposite sides of the spectrum. And we know that the end of that third year of decline, the crowds finally cried out, crucify him, crucify him. <coughs> amazing, amazing that they would do that after what they had seen this man do. So let's talk about these two men who are on the opposite sides of the pole, so to speak. So first of all, here at the first man, verse 18 through 20, is a man that uh, he really didn't consider his commitment he just kind of had an emotional appeal. So uh, this man, a certain scribe, so he's not a disciple as the man in verse number 21. He's a scribe. A scribe was a teacher of the law. He also inscribed or wrote copies of the law so that they could be uh, passed out. He was undoubtedly a teacher in a local synagogue. And he saw the crowds following Jesus he knew that he claimed to be, or people claimed for him to be, the Messiah. And he may have thought to himself, you know, if I hook up with this guy, and he comes to the throne, I could be in the court. It could have been in his mind, you know, I'm going to follow him to be a somebody. I'm going to follow him to get what I would like to get. And there are preachers today, and you've seen them on television perhaps, and you have to ask yourself, why are they disciples, not really disciples, why are they followers of Christ? And the answer would be for what they get out of it. They have their jet planes, they've got their multitude of houses, they make millions of dollars every year, and they never say anything negative because that might make the money go away. Jesus didn't worry about the crowds going away. He just preached the truth. 
And the man that preached the truth had 12 disciples that he taught for those three and a half years. And those 12 men went throughout all the world. And we have the results of that today. Millions upon millions of people have come to Christ as Lord and Savior. So this man maybe had been thinking of that, but I, I'm not quite sure. But the question certainly comes to mind, why do you follow Christ? Why do you come to church? Why are you part of our assembly? Why? Why do you go through the difficulties that, it, that often come into our lives because we are Christians? Family members don't understand us. Co-workers don't understand us. Perhaps I've known one man that was uh, literally fired for being a Christian. Now, they wouldn't say it that way, but you know when it comes that you've been fired because they don't want to promote you and they don't want your influence and your philosophy in the office. It's tough stuff, tough stuff. Now, I know we all like the, the, the happy good stuff. You know, Jesus loves everybody. Life's going to be good. If we're followers of Christ, things may be difficult. Fortunately, you and I happen to live in a country where things aren't as difficult as they are in other nations of the world. So our missionaries in Papua New Guinea, when those villagers came to Christ that they taught, they learned the language and taught them, some of those other villagers that didn't said, not part of the family anymore. You're listening to the lies of the devil. We can't have you continuing to do that. And so now they're facing opposition from their own people. But it should come as no surprise. Christianity has always faced opposition. It's facing opposition today. If we preach certain things about morals, they say, well, you just hate people. No, I love people enough to tell them the truth so they avoid hell and get into heaven. That's a much deeper love than just yeah, it's okay. God will just let you into heaven. You can live any wicked way you want to. Not true. Not true. So why do you follow Christ? Because following Christ is not easy. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung at the end of World War II by the Nazis because he tried to murder Hitler. He felt, and there's been a great debate on whether a Christian ought to do something like that. And I know there's great debates because we had it in Bible college. Is it morally correct to murder somebody like Hitler? Some people say, no, it's always wrong to murder. And some people said, no, because if you eliminate him, you eliminate all the other murders that are going on by that regime. Well, in the end, I think God answered the question, at least for me. God said, Dietrich, we're just going to bring you home. Enough of that foolishness. I'll take care of the affairs of the world. You take care of people's souls. And so he was hung weeks before the uh, war ended. He said this, only he who obeys truly believes. And only he who believes truly obeys. Hmm. That's true. People say, well, you know, you can't just be saved by believing. If you truly believe, yes, you are. Because you believe that the blood of Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death, has paid for your sins, and he has given to you eternal life. The righteousness of Christ, the Bible tells us, is placed upon those that come to him. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So, here's a man, he says, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, notice what Jesus does here. He kind of he kind of tramples down this man's enthusiasm. Now, you would think, wow, he'd, he'd say, and, and many churches would, you know, hey, just come on, come on. No, he really tramples down his enthusiasm. He said, listen, if you follow me, I just want you to know a couple of things. Number one, the animals in the fields, they have little dens and burrows they can go to. And the birds of the air, they have nests that they can get to at night. Me, 
I have nowhere to live. If you follow me, it's going to be a life of uncertainty. You don't know where we're going to eat our next meal because an itinerant preacher was at the mercy of those that were willing to give them food. Now, in Jesus' case, there were people that fed him. We know Mary and Martha went to their house and other houses as well, went to Peter's house and healed Peter's mother-in-law, which means Peter was married. As far as I know, you can't get a mother-in-law without marriage. Is that true? That's true. Can you imagine if you had your mother-in-law without being married? Wow, that would be tough. So he healed Peter's mother-in-law, and the Bible says she rose up immediately off the bed and began to minister to him. So he had places or people that would help him and feed him and his 12 disciples. Now, where did they sleep at night? Well, when you have 12 people, that's quite a crowd, and most homes in those days are small. So uh, I believe many nights he just slept under the stars. At other times, the disciples went to different homes, perhaps, and Jesus stayed in the homes of, say, Mary and Martha. Um, but when it came time for the thousands that followed him, well, what did he do then? Well, on one occasion, he said to his disciples, hey, have you got enough food to feed all these people? And they said, oh, they said, we got a, a few pennies here, a few shekels here. That's, that's not even enough money to buy enough food for all these people. He said, well, I'll tell you what. There's a little boy here who's got some loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Have everybody sit down. And Jesus broke the bread and broke open the fish. And we're not sure how it got multiplied, but as that basket went from person to person to person, it never emptied, never emptied. So he fed 5,000 people that day. So he said, it is a life of uncertainty. Not sure where we're gonna lay our head tonight. Not sure who's gonna provide meals. We do have some money on occasion. We do buy our own meals. But we're gonna depend on God and God alone. So when you think you're going to follow me anywhere or everywhere, I just want you to know there's going to be some difficulties that come in along the way. So if you're looking for a bed of roses, forget it. Forget it. Now let me, I want to remind you of something real quick. How many of you know, and I'm sure you've experienced this if you got saved or became a Christian later on in life, that even without Christ, Life is tough. Anybody notice that? Life is hard. It's hard growing up, whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. It's hard losing people you love, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. It's hard losing your job, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. It's tough hearing reports from the doctor that you've got something you don't want, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. So life in itself is tough because you live in a broken world. But when you add upon that Christianity, then it gets even a little tougher. But here's the good news. The good news is that through the insecurities, and I'll say insecurities on purpose, because really through those insecurities, when we're following Christ wholeheartedly, there's the security of depending on God and God alone the security of knowing that God will take care of us. It may not be the way we expect or what we would desire so much, but God says, I will take care of my own. So uh, we are secure in this disciple's insecurity, so to speak. So we come to a place where we trust God implicitly. You know what implicitly means to trust God implicitly? We all know what that word means, right? Well, just in case you don't, I checked it out on my thesaurus. It means to trust God completely, absolutely, totally, wholeheartedly, utterly, unconditionally, unreservedly, without reservation, without reserve, without qualification, trust him 100%, entirely, wholly, thoroughly, fully, utterly, absolutely. Anybody know what it means now? 
It means to trust God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Lord, whatever you bring into my life, I know that you brought it into my life or you've allowed it into my life for a purpose, to grow me up in Christ, to allow me to help others, to allow me to be a light in a very dark world. So here's a man, he's thinking to himself, and I know a lot of people, just like that man, I will follow Jesus wherever he takes me in life. And then he takes him someplace like Fall River, Massachusetts. And then they go back home to the Midwest. I will follow Christ wherever he brings me, but if it gets hard, I'm going to go back home. I know a lot of pastors did that. But I know a lot of people who do the same thing. I love that church. I love that church. God brought me to this church. Oh, well, now it's tough. Now i got to listen to the same preacher year after year. Yeah. I do, too. I do, too. But the fortunate thing for you is that the Holy Spirit can work through me to teach you something that God wants you to know. Amen. So, there are people like this man. They jump on board. Oh, all I have to do is believe. I believe. I believe. No. It's not that type of belief. It's a type of belief that ends up causing us to be different because we've been born again by the spirit of the living God, that we have new motivation in our life, new way of thinking, new desires. And the desire and the motivation is to please our Lord. Our desire and motivation is to be what God wants us to be. And part of what God wants us to be is to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world, to reach other people with the good news of Jesus Christ. So how many of us have ever met somebody that believes in God? We all have. Are they living for Christ? Undoubtedly not. But they believe in God. No, there's a difference between a disciple of Jesus Christ and somebody that just says, I believe. Interestingly enough, James says the devils believe and tremble. The devils believe in God. How many think there'll be devils or demons in heaven? No. Because they didn't follow Christ. He saved me from my sins, and now I want to live a life whereby I don't sin and offend him. He redeemed me from this old wicked world, and someday I will step in a new place, a heavenly world, a street of gold, and a heavenly city. So this man, Jesus on purpose, he squashes, he squelches his enthusiasm. He says, listen, if you're going to follow me, it's going to cost you something. Might cost you some money. Oh, Pastor, you're going to talk about money? Now, if you've been here any length of time, you know I rarely talk about money. You know why? Because I believe the Holy Spirit should convict you that you ought to give something back to the cause of Jesus Christ. Amen. Might cost you time. Oh, Pastor, church is earlier now. If you go to Sunday school, you've got to get up earlier. You've got to be at church by 9.30 in the morning on Sunday. It's so early. I know, that's what I said to myself when I woke up this morning. My wife actually woke me up by way of the dog. <laughs> she opened the bedroom door and let the dog jump on the bed. I know your tricks. <laughs> It'll cost us something. It costs us something. We, have, we left our home and our family. Went to college, New York. Then after six months, they said, we're moving to college to Boston. It's like, we just got here. <laughs> then we had to find a place in Brockton, Massachusetts. The lovely city, Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, yeah. yeah. But it costs you something. <laughs> Cost time, cost effort. God wants people to do things for the cause of Christ. You have a gift, a talent, an ability. Cost us something.
So this man's enthusiasm, Jesus kind of squashed that. He said, listen, if you're going to follow me, you're going to pay a price. But can I ask you a question? How can you not follow the one that's given you eternal life? How can you not walk after him and say, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'm willing to go. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm willing to do. Well, let's quickly get to the other man. And this man is actually a disciple of the Lord. He's one of those in the crowd following the Lord. He's not one of the 12 apostles, but he's one of the crowd, a disciple. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first, allow me first to go and bury my father. Now that seems like a reasonable request. If in fact his father was dead. Because Jesus is not telling us not to bury those that have passed away. The man wasn't saying, let me go home and attend the funeral of my father. That's not what he's saying here. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. That seems like a very harsh statement. Yeah, the exact opposite, if you will, of the first statement. But the idea is this. No, you want to go back and live with your father until he dies. And then you're going to come and follow me. No, there's no other priority in life that comes before following me. No other priority, including family. I know people that worship their kids to the point where they refuse to follow Christ because of their kids. Wrong priority. Wrong priority. By the way, if you follow Christ, do you think he will let your children and your family fall to utter ruin and despair? Of course not. But people miss out on what God wants them to do because they put other things first and they ought not. So the disciple is not asking permission to go home to a funeral. He's asking for whatever reason. Maybe his father has a business and the son wants to inherit the business. Maybe he's worried what his dad will say if he becomes a, a follower of Christ. But Jesus said, you let the dead, the spiritually dead, bury the dead. If you're going to follow me, follow me. And that's the idea. So the habit that some of us have is to put anything else before Jesus. Any other priority. Now, half our church is missing today. Now, on any given Sunday, a third of our church is missing. Maybe a quarter. But there are always people missing. You say, well, a lot of people have been sick. Yes, they have been, and I, I agree that when you're sick, please don't come. But if you're home for some other reason, some other priority that has come up, it's wrong, absolutely wrong. You say, well, I have to work on Sunday. Well, if you have to, yes, if you work in a, an industry that, uh, say, the police or at a hospital or healthcare industry, yes, those are needs. But if the boss says, hey, I need you to come in on Sunday, no, nah, I'll come in after I attend church to worship my God. See, right then and there, you become a shining light, don't you? And a lot of people don't like that. Oh, church. I know a lot of people that worship sports more than they worship God. Because as soon as the weather breaks, sports are going to start up again. And guess which day they always have their games on? Sunday. Sunday. Afternoon? No. Sunday morning. Coach, I want my kid to be part of the team. But I believe it's more important to worship the true and the living God on Sunday morning. The resurrection day. Can he come after church and be part of the team? No, he's got to be here. Son, I'm going to teach you a valuable lesson. What's more important to me and my family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. I wish you could be on the team, but they won't let you. So we have to make a choice. And because you're young, I'm going to make the choice for you at this point in time. When you're older, you can make your own choice. But we're going to go to the house of God and worship. You say, oh, you can't do that to a kid. 
I believe you ought to do it to a kid. Because when you don't do it, you just taught them church is secondary. You know, you go if you got time. You go if it's convenient. You go if nothing else comes up in life. No. Church attendance is public worship, the true and the living God. We've collectively come here this morning to worship the Lord and to hear from his word. What does God have to say? Well, that's what you, Pastor Warren. That's what you believe. No, that's what the Bible talks about. To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first commandment. And what's the second commandment? To love your neighbors as yourself. Do I love God enough to come to worship him publicly with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Yes, I do. Otherwise, I'd say to the dog, get out of this room, shut the door behind you, I'm going back to bed. So we come here for a reason. A church is the body in Christ. A church is not to come and sit in the pews, but to come and worship to sing, to glorify God, to bless his heart, to learn something from the scriptures, and to utilize our spiritual gifts that we might be a blessing to other people. We have some Sunday school teachers. They teach the kids to be a blessing to the parents so that the parents can come and sit in the adult class and not have to worry about the kids. Kind of disrupting things, coloring. We used to have stacks of crayons and coloring. You sit there, quiet, quiet. We used to, we used to, uh, how many know what alien tape is? We used to alien tape the kids right to the seats. They couldn't even, really, just kidding. Duct tape, just duct tape. Church is more than just coming together and being here for an hour. We're here to help each other, to encourage each other, to bless each other. We're here for a reason. Discipleship is tough stuff. It's not easy. At the end of some services, I go to the back of the room and I shake hands with people leaving. And you've seen movies where pastors and other churches, you know, the pastors just outside the front door and he's saying goodbye to everybody and everybody's supposed to, I don't know what they're supposed to do, compliment the pastor or something. Good message, Pastor. That was a good message. Oh, so it didn't step on your toes. That was a good message, Pastor. Oh, so it made you laugh, but it, no conviction. That's what I think a lot of times. Good message. And then, of course, there's other messages where you, you, you hit hard, you ram it, you yell, you scream, you spit. Good message, Pastor. I agreed with every point. Yeah, that's good. But what's more important is are we getting something that God is trying to give to us? So this pastor went to the back of uh, his church and he's shaking hands and a man comes along and grabs the pastor's hand. The pastor kind of pulls him aside. He says, listen, I need you to be in the army of the Lord. And the man said, pastor, I, I am in the army of the Lord. He said, why do I only see you on Easter and Christmas? And the man said, because I'm in the secret service. <laughs> Can I simply say this? There is no secret service. There is no secret service. We come out and say loudly and proudly, I am a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. This is a true story. The first one probably wasn't. A pastor met a young man who had joined the army. And this is the time when we went to war in Iraq. I call it a war. Well, we call it a war. Went to war in Iraq. And, uh, and this young man didn't want to go. He said, Pastor, I don't want to go. And the pastor talked to him and said, you know, what's the problem? He said, well, he said, I, I didn't join the army to go to war. He said, I, I joined because of the benefits, the pay, the college, the retirement plan. You know, armies are created for a single use. And that is to protect the citizens of the nation. 
When you join the army, you know what it's all about, or at least you should. You don't join an army for the benefits, though people do. Now, the benefits really are just perks. The reason you join is to defend the nation, to defend people, to defend your family. So he had the wrong philosophy, did he not? Wrong philosophy, I'm not, you know, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. But that same philosophy happens in churches. See, the church is here for a purpose. It's to disciple people so they can go out into the world and lead others to Christ because of how you're living. That people should see Christ in you. They should see that no matter what you're going through in life, you still have great faith, a positive attitude. Yes, you may have tears on your cheeks, but a positive attitude that God's going to see me through this. Things are going to work out. He will do a work in me that will cause me to be a better Christian and have better faith. But let me just give you three points here. The close of life and the close of this message. The question that's going to be asked us is not how much have you gotten, but how much did you give? It's not going to be how much have you won, but how much have you done for Christ? It's not how much have you saved, but how much have you sacrificed for the cause of Christ? See, we're stewards. God's given us our time, our money, our talents, our treasures, and the gospel. And someday there'll be an accounting. Jesus, the manager, the owner of all things, including all the time that he gave us on planet Earth. And they would say, now there's an accounting. What did you do? How much did you give? What did you sacrifice? You say, it won't be like that. It's going to be like the way I think. God's a good guy. He's just going to let us all into heaven. Oh, no, there's an accounting. You say, well, that's kind of tough. That's right. It's tough stuff. But endure the tough stuff. Because at the end, it's a blessing. Bring that phone up here. I'm going to shoot it right now. <laughs> but let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning.